Welcome to EPG Patshala. This is your module on the Scarlet Letter written by Nathaniel Hawthorne and published in 1850, 14 years before his death. I am Shurmila Mujumdar, Associate Professor, Department of English, University of Kullani, West Bengal. Here are a few biographical details of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Born as Nathaniel Hawthorne, he later added a W. Hawthorne belonged to a family that descended from the earliest settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. His ancestors emigrated to Massachusetts in the early 17th century. The earliest Hawthorns took part in the persecution of the Quakers and those thought to be witches. Now a few words about the Puritans. Puritans were the English settlers on the American soil who left Great Britain because they felt they were being persecuted for their religious beliefs. And Hawthorne was a descendant of the Puritanical family and uh, in almost uh, all his writings, his the tension between his Puritanical brought up and his uh, consistent questioning of the Puritanical belief can be found. So, the core of his work is formed by this tension. He was a voracious reader as a child and as a boy he read the works of Shakespeare, Milton, John Bunyan and James Thompson. You can see here how important English literature was, was for the Americans even in the 19th century. Uh, almost all the major writers who schooled themselves in great literary traditions of the world were very well acquainted with the uh, major writers of the English literature. According to a library record, he borrowed at least 1200 works of non-fiction from Salem Athenaeum. So, he was a voracious reader, not only fiction, not only drama, not only poetry, he also read a lot of non-fiction as well. In 1845, he got work as a custom surveyor. The narrator in the novel, The Scarlet Letter was also a custom surveyor. So, this part of the novel can be autobiographical. Uh, work as a custom surveyor for the port of Salem. Uh, when the Whigs won in the 1848 election, he lost his job. So, he was without a job and he had uh, um, an old document which described the Salem witch hunt. So, he began to write the Scarlet Letter in September 1849 and finished it in February 1850. Now, uh, how do you categorize the Scarlet Letter? Uh, it is part of the curriculum of novel, but what kind of a novel is this? It has been variously described as a historical novel, a romance or even a historical romance. Now, you know, uh, when we talk about historical novel, we presuppose factual background to the novel, major characters are all historically real characters and uh, major events are also historical. And when it comes to romance, well, whatever background you have, romance is the most important thing. Romance is what matters in the narrative. And if it is a historical romance, then history plays a part providing the background and some of the characters, some of the events and there is romance in it. Now, uh, what we understand by romance? Uh, you know, romance primarily referred to a genre of uh, writing which, were, which was written in one of the many romance languages. From there, the word romance and from there, the adjective romantic is derived. So, in a way, the Scarlet Letter can be described as a historical romance also. Well, in preface to the House of Seven Gables, um, he writes, 
When a writer calls his work a romance, it need hardly be observed that he wishes to claim certain latitude. Because you know, as I was talking about that this was a kind of writing practiced in the various romance languages um, and uh, which talked about uh, characters remote from reality places far away from uh, where the readers are. And so he made it clear that uh, there is no wish to claim certain in latitude both as to its fashion and material which he would not have felt himself entitled to assume had he professed to be writing a novel. The latter form of composition is presumed to aim at a very minute fidelity not merely to the possible but to the probable and ordinary course of man's experience. So the dichotomy between a romance and a novel is clear. The former, while as a work of art, it must rigidly subject itself to laws and while it seems unpardonably so far as it may swerve aside from the truth of the human heart, has fairly a right to present that truth under circumstances to a great extent of the writer's own choosing or creation. He will be wise, no doubt, to make very moderate use of the privileges here stated and especially to mingle the marvelous rather as a slight, delicate and evanescent flavor than as any portion of the actual substance of the dish offered to the public. So the culinary metaphor makes it clear that romance is a garnishing and novel is the uh, main dish. The Scarlet Letter is described sometimes as a romance with, uh, which means it is fiction, but a fiction which is tinged with history. As a romance, this text maintains a balance between the natural and the marvelous, the history and the fiction. So there is a commingling of both. By history, it is meant it is factual and by fiction, it is an work of imagination. He focused on the nation's past, especially the Puritan era. And I probably told you before that uh, Puritanism was the all in encompassing religious discourse of American life in the 16th and the 17th centuries. And Hawthorne came from a Puritan family and that there was a tension in, at the heart of his work, a tension between puritanical um, ideology or discourse and a contestation and interrogation of the same. Charles Riskamp points out the extent of Hawthorne's fidelity to the historical accounts in Caleb H. Snow's History of Boston as well as his point of deviations from it. So, there are uh, points of fidelity and there are points of divergences and you, you can see very well that the points of fidelity they are also enumerated on the one hand and points of divergences they are enumerated on the other hand. Hawthorne borrows from Snow's historical account of Boston the name of Master Bracket the Jailer. There is also a striking similarity between Snow's description of an ancient building and Hawthorne's description of Governor Bellingham's house. Uh, so you see this part of the novel is uh, historical and factual. Snow is also the only historian who tells the story of Mrs. Sharman's pig in order to bring out its effect upon the early Massachusetts government. Hawthorne refers to this incident, a dispute concerning the right of property in a pig not only caused a fierce and bitter contest in the legislative body of the colony, but resulted in an important modification of the uh, framework itself of the legislature. So, you have to remember that the uh, period that is being described in the novel is the colonial period before the American Revolution. Well, Hawthorne was uh, faithful to history uh, on many counts as well. There is also striking similarities between Snow's account of Mrs. Hibbins and Hawthorne's characterization of Mrs. Hibbins. So, she can be considered a historical figure. 
Hawthorne's reference to Mrs. Heavens as Bellingham's sister seems to have its source in a footnote by James Savage in the 1825 edition of John Winthrop's History of New England. And it was this edition that Hawthorne borrowed from the Salem Athenaeum. So you can see clearly the link between Hawthorne's uh, reading and the way he has used the material in his novel. Hawthorne's characterization of John Wilson as a man of kind and genial spirits corresponds to Snow's reference to his compassion for the uh, distressed and affection for all. So, in a way, John Wilson is also a historical uh, character. Well, these are points of convergences and there are points of divergences as well. So, Hawthorne also deviates from history at some points. However, Riskamp argues that these changes were not made because of lack of knowledge of the facts, nor merely by whom, but according to definite purposes. Now, let me tell you, whenever uh, novelists or for that matter dramatists used history, they often deviated and most of the time the deviation was neither an act of uh, omission or lack of knowledge or uh, simply whim. Most of the time it served a purpose, uh, an artistic purpose, a literary purpose and Hawthorne was no exception to this. Hawthorne to gain dramatic opposition to Dimsdale makes the preacher seem older than he really was. So, this is one deviation. Dimsdale has been presented as much older than what he was in real life at that point of time. Hawthorne refers to him as the good old minister and pictures him in a beard white as a snow drift. So, you can see clearly the um, color of the beard. Uh, white, pristine white and so uh, the symbolism is very clear here. Well, uh, there are other points of divergences as well. Uh, in history, Winthrop uh, died in March. In Hawthorne's text, he dies in May. So, why did he do that? It is only a matter of two months. One of the possible reasons is um, there was a night long vigil after his death. March was too cold for that. That is why Hawthorne shifted the time of his death rather the month of his death to May. Hawthorne also might have realized that for a powerful climax, not more than one or two weeks should uh, elapse between the night of Winthrop's death when Dimsdale stood on the scaffold. And I remind you that there are two scaffold scenes in the novel. The first one in which Hester Prince stands on the scaffold and admits to his um, to her sin, though she does not name the partner in her sin. And the second one is this when Dimsdale uh, stands on the scaffold. And the public announcement of his sin to the crowd on election day. In history, election took place in May or June. He had to choose between March and May. So, he chose May. So, what did he basically do? He collapsed Dimsdale's confession with the election day. That is why the it was shifted from March to May. And so, you can clearly see how he has used it to an artistic purpose. We know that there was a gap of exactly seven years between the first scaffold scene and the second scaffold scene. Therefore, the first four chapters may be placed in June 1642. Hawthorne says that at uh, this time, Bellingham was governor. However, in history, Winthrop was governor at this time. Here, Hawthorne plays with historical accuracy and sticks to Bellingham, most probably to make use of Mrs. Hibbins as Bellingham's do daughter. So, you see the purpose again, it was necessary for the plot construction of the novel. 
Though Hawthorne has given the framework uh, a real historical setting to the novel, he also scatters a few mysterious elements um, in the novel. But even before we go into the enumeration of these mysterious elements like uh, glowing red eyes, the A in the sky, Mrs. Hibbs and the black man in the woods and pearl, we have to remember that Puritans were uh, superstitious and they believed in all kinds of superstitions. So, uh, a text like this would not have been very unacceptable and probably would have seemed quite uh, normal to a puritanical readership or audience for that matter. But all these mysterious elements seem to border on the supernatural but are never uh, quite it. Hawthorne makes very moderate use of the marvelous, rather as a slight, delicate and evanescent flavor. Uh, as you remember, the culinary metaphor that was being used to prepare, as he says in the custom house chapter, a uh, neutral territory between the real world and fairyland, where the actual and the imaginary may meet. So, a point of negotiation between fact and fiction. Well, uh, I was talking about the Puritans who were superstitious, who believed in all kinds of omens and potents and now the question comes, uh, this uh, sp spattering of supernatural, uh, is this a projection of Puritanical mindset? Is this a projection of the Puritan superstitions? However, John C. Stubbs argues for Hawthorne, the balance of the marvelous and the natural was inherent in the New England superstitions because the Puritans believed that most of the natural omens and potents were, um, uh, were their guide to live the right kind of life. So, they did not see the, super, the supernatural as something unusual, as something unnatural. Riskamp claims even the potent in the sky, the great red letter A, which was seen on the night of the river John Winthrop's death and Dimsdale's vigil, would not have seemed too strange to Puritan historians. Uh, this is something what I was trying to argue that it was it was natural for them, it was not supernatural, they accepted it as a part of, as a way of their lives. Indeed, Snow had written that during John Cotton's death in 1652, strange and alarming signs appeared in the heavens. Uh, Stubbs also points out about Chillingworth that Hawthorne stresses the superstitious wonder directed at this man of medical skill by the Puritans. So, you can clearly see the dichotomy. Chillingworth was by profession a doctor, a medical practitioner and so a man of science and the Puritans did not hesitate to, um, to impose certain uh, superstitious beliefs on him also. So, science was also not beyond the purview of Puritanic uh, superstition. He further adds that in similar quote, in similar fashion, uh, Hawthorne envelops Pearl and the Scarlet Letter with the aura of the marvelous, usually working through the minds of superstitious onlookers. So, it is more in the mind of the superstitious onlookers than it is uh, in the mind of the author himself. After about um, 130 years of its publication, Scarlet Letter has been severely subjected to feminist reading and rereading. Susan Lust writes, the narrator's equivocal style has inspired much critical speculation as to the novel's underlying ideology, including the debate over whether the novel is a seminal work of proto-feminism or just the opposite. So, uh, one thing that I always felt when I read that novel, that though it has been uh, read as a feminist novel, somehow I find that 
Hester Prynne, the protagonist, she was not particularly aware to the um, ideas, I am not talking about ideology, the question of ideology does not arise, even the ideas of feminism. No doubt that she was a very strong woman, uh, she was, uh, she uh, she had fortitude, but she was in my judgment not particularly uh, feminist. Well, uh, it is the woman who alone bears the whole punishment, that is the way of patriarchy. She is made to stand on the scaffold, we are the mark of shame and live on the periphery of the society. But the man responsible for her adultery escapes the punishment and lives freely at the heart of the society with full dignity. We have to remember that she uh, he was part of the patriarchal dispensation that ruled the society at that point of time. And uh, Simone de Beauvoir comes in very handy in second sex. She writes, he commits the fault but unloads is unto her. The fact that Hester's partner belongs to the very body of the male authority which punishes her reminds us again of another line from the second sex, quote, he pushes her to abortion, adultery, misdeeds, betrayal and lies he himself officially condemns. Thus, at a basic level, Hawthorne's plot itself seems to invite feminist attack. But one thing that must be uh, mentioned a, a here that Hester Prynne did not abort her child, she gave birth to that child, she nurtured the child to adulthood, she lived on the periphery of the society, she was brave, she was courageous. So, uh, from that perspective, he probably uh, achieved something which feminists would have wanted her to achieve without being explicitly aware of it. However, from the Christian perspective, while Hester makes her purgatorial journey from damnation to salvation, Hester's silence makes Dimsdale suffer within inferno since, as Dante says, hell is a state and not a place. Uh, well, ambiguity remains because the feminists probably will not accept the argument that the way Dimsdale silently suffer is punishment enough for his sin. Hester certainly exerts a subversive force towards the beginning of the novel, but on the other hand, she seems to bear no feminist consciousness as such. As she reveals the later A surrounded with an elaborate embroidery and fantastic flourishes of gold thread, she seems to celebrate what is supposed to be the mark of her shame. And uh, is this a defiance? or is this a lack of awareness? It promises a bold female personality who defies the Puritan patriarchal morality, but then Hester fails to sustain this promise as later she herself conforms to the Puritan moral codes and thinks that she has indeed committed a grave sin. We know that the punishment for adultery in the 17th century was whipping and even death. Then, by suppressing the historical facticity of whipping, is Hawthorne suggesting that the Puritan authority was not as harsh as it is taken to be? One woman thinks that the magistrates are merciful over much and says that at the very least they should have put the brand of a hot iron on Hester Prince's forehead. Now you see, um, uh, this kind of widens the um, uh, framework of discussion of the scarlet letter as a feminist text because the women in the novel who has uh, who have been far more cruel and uh, strict than the law enforcing authority can also be read at the um, as Hawthorne's own uh, negotiation between his puritanical upbringing and inheritance and his contestation of the puritanical ideology that uh, overwhelmingly controlled the lives of people during the 17th century. Another woman goes so far as to say that this woman has brought shame upon us all uh, 
and ought to die. Thus, it has been argued Hawthorne has distorted historical truth to show that contemporary women could be harsher and crueler than the kind Puritan authority. And well, this is, uh, this can also be, as I was arguing, a uh, literary technique by which he is contrasting the puritanical rule with the uh, 17th century um, public mindset because we have to remember that the women who came to the scaffold scene and witnessed the shaming of Hester Prynne were born and brought up into a puritanical culture which taught them to believe in the, uh, in the chastity of women, the scene of committing adultery and they were, they accepted that women who commit adultery should be severely punished. So, it can not, it may be that it is also a historical representation of the contemporary public mindset. Uh, now, we come to the deconstruction of the letter A because this, this letter A is embroidered and put on the chest of Hester Prince dress. What does this A mean? The fact that Hester has been compelled to put on the letter A signifying adultery indicates man's writing or representation of the woman. It can be connected with the male gaze that Hester is subjected to in this scaffold scene. Laura Malvi argues that the determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure which is styled accordingly. Uh, well, it is definitely a male gaze which decides that Hester is a loose woman and adulteress and should be indicated as such and uh, that probably uh, will satisfy the last that may have been contained in the male gaze. Interestingly, Hester's needlework deconstructs this patriarchal language the letter A by appropriating the same language to rewrite herself. In chapter uh, 13, we see that many people refuse to interpret this scarlet A by its original signification. They say that it meant able. So strong was Hester Prynne with a woman's strength. So you see the complete passage of the meaning of the letter A. When it was put up on Hester Prynne's uh, chest, it was adultery. And towards the end of the novel, she has been strong, she has been courageous, she has been stubborn, she has supported herself and her daughter and she has in a way uh, defied the authority of the puritanical church and proved herself to be so able that people forgot the original signification of adultery and came to interpret A as able. So, here is a puritanical allegory as well in the text. Uh, Hawthorne Swark the best known uh, of this variety is not uh, is not uh, the lone work. There has been an ancestry of this kind of writing in American literature, and though they are not so well known, might have provided Hawthorne with some kind of idea about what he was going to do with the story of Hester Prynne. Hawthorne's work might be placed in a tradition beginning from the first American novels like The Power of Sympathy published in 1789 by William Hill Brown, Charlotte Temple by Susanna Haswell Rawson published in 1794 and The Cocket or the History of Eliza Wharton published in 1797 by Hannah Webster Forrest. So, there is a is a long, rather long ancestry of such novels where a woman stands at the center of the novel. What Richard Gray finds common in all these novels is a clear basis in fact, actuality. So, anticipating and meeting any possible objections to fiction, imaginative self-indulgence or daydreaming and even clearer moral purpose. So, anticipating and meeting any possible objections from Puritans or utilitarians and a narrative that flirts with sensation and indulges in sentiment. So, encouraging the reader to read on. 
So, you can see when these, these novels, the three that have already been named were being written in the late uh, 18th century, Puritanism was uh, very much in force and the Puritans did not believe in fiction, they believed in fact, they believed in cold uh, reality, they did not believe in imagination. So, this tradition of novel writing always had a basis in um, real life incidents, so that the Puritans cannot dispute the fact that that uh, they are based on facts that is point number one and uh, secondly what happened that they uh, preempted any objection from the Puritans as to the imaginative fictitious nature of these writings. So, in a way Hawthorne anticipated this kind of objection to his writing and that is why he probably gave his work of fiction a strong historical factual framework. The tradition of Scarlet Letter um, in a way uh, still continues. Rawson also says, quote, I have thrown over the whole a slight veil of fiction and Hawthorne as he says in the custom house chapter tries to tinge the history with a magic moonshine so that the history is invested with a quality of strangeness and remoteness though still almost as visibly present as by daylight. So, you see certain points are coming into convergence. Uh, first that it is uh, partly history at least a very strong factual framework of this narrative and Hawthorne was very conscious that he was throwing a veil of magic moonshine over this historical narration. And the other point which converges with this, why did he do that? That is the question. Why did he write these romans rather than writing a historical novel? Because he always uh, put uh, theological and spiritual questions into the narrative of this novel and thereby rendering it imaginative and uh, partly uh, a romance, but he was aware that Puritans were not very happy with the idea of fiction of imaginative work and that is why he tried to negotiate between uh, the Puritanical objection which he might have anticipated and the kind of work that he wanted to do. Rawson also insists on the moral purpose of her writing. For the perusal of the young and the thoughtless of the fair sex, this tale of truth is designed and such a moralizing tone might be discerned in Hawthorne's work as well. Well, you know that uh, in the 19th century, you will find lots of American women writing short stories in the local color tradition about domesticity, about marriage and this has later been deconstructed by the feminists as a way of manipulating the female population by the white uh, protestant uh, male publishing houses so that the kind of fiction that is being written by the the women will be consumed by the women and thereby will consolidate the patriarchal position. So, to sum up, this has been your module on the novel uh, Scarlet Letter. You know that it has been written by a man who was brought up into a strict puritanical tradition and a man who later in life came to doubt the puritanical tradition and the tension is there at the heart of the novel. You know that it is based on some historical facts. There is a very strong historical background. Some of the characters are historical characters in the novel, but it is also a puritanical allegory because the scarlet letter itself the A is allegorical and it uh, explores the puritanical way of thinking and uh, it can also be read partly at least as a feminist text that here is a woman who has squarely defied the patriarchal dispensation of period 17th century puritanical America and stood her ground. Thank you.